Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good. I'm going to start by just giving you guys a little background about myself. Um, um, I was born and raised in Tampa. I grew up on the east side of town. Uh, my grandmother actually lived on Palm Avenue, uh, not far from here, like two blocks down. But uh, what got me interested in law enforcement is, you know, in the 60s and 70s, there was a very strained relationship between uh, law enforcement and the community, kind of what we're seeing today. So living in that environment, uh, I lived on the east side and public housing. So that was not something that you went outside and told everybody you wanted to do, which was become a police officer, not living in public housing. You know, that's guaranteed a beat down. Um, but because of that strained relationship between law enforcement and the community, um, I was, figured I'd join the police department and make a difference. So at the age of 21, I joined the police department back in 1988. I actually, Richard, I don't know where he went. Uh, there he is. He was one of the uh, instructors, so that's how long he's been here. Uh, back when I came to the academy. But um, back in 88, all I wanted to do was have a job. You know, jobs are very hard to get, uh, especially growing up in that environment. So joining the police department, my, the idea behind it was to make a difference. You know, trying to change the culture of law enforcement from within. So starting off as a police officer, I tried to circulate myself throughout the department as on many different assignments, many different squads, many different divisions, so I can learn how the police department actually works. Um, I started off in patrol, of course. Every police officer starts in patrol. And from patrol, patrol I went to criminal intelligence, uh, worked gangs and prostitution and street level narcotics. Uh, when I made sergeant, I took over our canine unit as a, as a canine supervisor. In the middle of all of that, I tried out for our negotiation team, hostage negotiation team and became a negotiator. Um, that was kind of a little slow pace for me. I'm more of an adrenaline junkie, so a couple years after that, um, I tried out for the SWAT team and made the SWAT team, and I uh, was on the SWAT team for several years until I made lieutenant. Uh, once I made lieutenant, they booted me off the SWAT team. Um, I actually, when I was a sergeant, they booted me off the team. As a lieutenant, they brought me back as the commander, so I came, commanded our SWAT team for several years. Then I made captain and went back to patrol, which I enjoy being in patrol. Everything's fast paced and makes the day go by faster. And then from captain, then deputy chief, then assistant chief, then chief of police. Now saying that, when I came to the department, that wasn't a goal of mine, to be a chief of police at any agency. Uh, like I said earlier, I was just happy to have a job. Um, but I was fortunate enough to get put in this opportunity, given this opportunity to become the chief of, for the city of Tampa Police Department. So all of those little ideas I had throughout 28 years, um, being a chief of police, I actually get an opportunity to kind of implement some of those ideas and some of those changes. You know, a lot of guys that take this job, uh, their impression of law enforcement or the job is to arrest people and write tickets. There's a lot more involved in law enforcement than arresting people and writing tickets. You know, a big portion of that is making sure we have a strong relationship with the community. Because we're only as strong as our community. If we don't have any trust from the community, we're not a good police agency. So after they swore me in as the chief of police, uh, I outlined three different goals. One was our focus on our youth and our youth programs, because one thing I found out is that, you know, by the time the kids get into ninth grade, especially African-American kids, we were losing probably 50% of the African-American males when they, turned, when they got to ninth grade. So that was a problem for me. And I, I had to try to figure out a way or a solution or a way that we can, as law enforcement officers, be involved in that process to make sure that there was an equal opportunity or ample opportunity for those kids at that age group, those demographics, to have an equal opportunity to be successful in life. So to focus on our, our youth and um, teen programs, we started a, a Citizens Academy for our youth is we take all the kids from all over the, the city and put them into like a police academy and we run them through the whole thing so they get an idea or a taste for law enforcement and hopefully some of those kids will join our Explorer program. Our Explorer program is ranged from age 13 to 20. When they turn 21 they have to get out of the program and hopefully by that time uh, they're ready to join the police department, get an academy and be a police officer. But being in that Explorer program, it, it teaches them how to be a police officer it gives them a head start. So you learn how to build a police officer way before they get the job. My second focus was on uh, training about police officers. You know, when I look at the shootings that are happening throughout the country, 
What I've learned is that uh, a lot of the bad police shootings, in my opinion, are based on fear. Not understanding the culture, not being properly trained, so you have these type of reactions. So focusing on our training of our law enforcement officers here in Tampa was one of my primary goals. And the, second, the third was our violent crime. You know, what we're seeing in the city of Tampa, we're not unique from any other city throughout the nation, uh, throughout the country, uh, violent crime is on the rise. But what's unique about Tampa is we're seeing a lot more uh, youth, young kids getting involved in violent crime. The old school fighting each other with their fists, we don't see that anymore as much. Um, now kids like to um, settle their disputes with guns. And that's a problem for us. Because if they're selling their disputes with guns, of course the violent crime goes up. I get a call from the mayor, which he's my boss, he doesn't like it, and everything kind of rolls downhill. So those three goals were I outlined when I came on as the chief of police, and those are the things I'm gonna focus on. Now focusing on our violent crime, in 2002, we were probably number two in the country for our violent crime. You know, that's a problem. You know, when you run a race or you compete, you always want to be number one and two. Well, that's not a category that we want to be a number two in any, anybody's books. So in 2002, we, we created a program or a system called Focus on Four. And what we did, we, we focused on our auto thefts, auto burglaries, robberies, and residential burglaries. So in 2002, uh, focusing on those four crimes, we realized that those were companion crimes for other things. So a bad guy would steal a car to go and rob someone. Or the bad guy would steal a car to break in someone's house and take that property to go to the pawn shop. So when we focused on those four crimes, we saw a dramatic decrease in our crime throughout the city. So moving forward to today, we've reduced crime probably about 70% over the last 12 years. And that's something that we're proud of. Now, <clears throat> 2016, 2015, that focus on violent crime, that was one of the things that we had to address. So that focus on four turned into a focus on five. Focusing on that five, which is the violent crime element, was we started a partnership with ATF. And I created a violent crime unit um, beginning of this year. Every year we look at our deployment and our resources to see how we could better utilize our resources out in the street to give the community uh, quicker response time, and basically what they're paying for is quality of service. So we put about 40 guys into this room, we shook them up, and we created this violent crime unit, partnered with ATF. So since we started our violent crime unit, I think we've indicted 16 individuals uh, federally for gun charges and shootings. But the, the problem that we're still having on the street is that um, that stop snitching culture. Nobody wants to get involved unless it, it involves them directly or affects them directly. So we started a couple programs to help with that process. We started a gun bounty program, which uh, basically if you call the police department and provide that information that we need along with uh, the person that's committed a crime and if we can cover the firearm, we'll write you a check for $1,000. So that's already paid off. We've had several tips. One, that we were able to catch a guy that did a robbery within 24 hours, tips to call in, and we were able to get him in the fire room to bring that victim some kind of conclusion. So that works. Partnering up in the ATF has been instrumental to our crime fight. You know, because we partnered with ATF, you know, the bad guys know. And we're the only agency, probably in the Bay Area, that still has a pursuit policy where we can chase stolen cars or auto burglary suspects. That's something that you know, I don't take very lightly because we're the only agency, like I said, in this Bay Area that still does that. So the ultimate goal is to start the pursuit before it even happens. And we have resources that we use, uh, cool cars, we call them cool cars. We have guys that work plain clothes. Uh, ultimately, the, the, the goal is to trap the car before it flees so we don't have that risk of injuring someone um, or injuring a police officer. That's the ultimate goal behind it. Now talking about our police department, or the police department, we have a very lean staff. And there's a chief of police, then I have two assistant chiefs, and then we have six majors. So one chief has all patrol operations. She supervises, her name is Mary O'Connor. She supervises all the patrol, the guys in uniform. And the other chief 
as Chief Brian Dugan. Uh, he supervises basically everything else, the specialty teams, uh, homicide, sex crimes, and all that stuff. Now under those guys, each one of them has three majors. Uh, in patrol, you have three districts. We have District 1, which is our west side of the city, you know, basically from the river west to the airport all the way down to McDill Air Force Base. District 2 is Hillsborough Avenue north all the way up to Tampa Palms. That's run by a major. And the last district is District 3, which is where you guys are at now. It has all of the east side of town, Channel Side, and Ybor City. Now the other side of the house, which is in the Bryan's area, we have three majors. And we have one major over investigations, which has the homicides, sex crimes, and stuff like that. And then we have one major over uh, administration. He has personnel training. It's real glamorous. You know, he, he has all the fun stuff. And then the last major is our major over special operations. And that's the major over all of our special events. He supervises the SWAT, dive, bomb, hostage negotiate, anything that's special, anything that's not in patrol. And that pretty much makes up our staff. When I say we're lean, that's pretty much it. I have two captains that work for me, direct, work directly for me. Uh, one's in um, internal affairs. We call it professional standards. And the other captain is in um, our criminal intelligence bureau. And the way that's broken down is, if there's any type of administrative investigation, when, meaning a policeman messes up or screws up on something, it goes to internal affairs. So when you guys call and complain and says, hey, you know, I don't like the way he talked to me, or he used too much force, it goes to internal affairs and they investigate it for a policy violation. And on occasions, we have guys that, uh, you know, misuse their authority. And when they misuse their authority, that investigation goes to criminal intelligence. And normally when it goes to criminal intelligence, it's on the criminal, in that criminal area. And a lot of times those investigations happen they happen, they take place, and the officer never knows about it. Unless we find it to be true, then of course there's an arrest, and uh, then that's when you guys find out about it. Now, s speaking about those two divisions in that particular area, and focusing on our crime, our city's broken up into 240 grids. Like if you take the entire city of Tampa, we have 200, we made like little boxes, and there's 240 of them. <coughs> You know, people, the old day of police work is when you, something happened, you kind of threw a big net, and hopefully you catch the bad guy. Well, we we've took that whole concept and scrapped it and revamped it, and now we're more strategic on our approach to fighting crime. So, and part of that's knowing our offenders. So, our offender-based model, when, when you guys commit a crime or somebody else commits a crime, we know who you are. It goes into a database. We call it Street Smart, street smart now. Uh, so when a particular crime happens in that grid, we can punch in an MO, a closing description, or TATS, or whatever the information we have, punch it into the computer, it tells us in that grid who more than likely were the suspects that committed that crime. So it doesn't tell us who did it, but it points us in the right direction, a place to start. So with under, under those 240 grids, we, we built in an alarm system. So we call it a red grid tracker. You know, the grid starts white and yellow, uh, yellow, orange, and then red. When it turns red, then there's a problem. And we meet twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays, what we call staff meetings. So when the grid turns red, the majors come to staff, and they have to explain to me why is it turning red, because then there's a problem. You know, we, we could have used five, we could have used 20, but we chose 10. So 10 part one offenses in that grid, it'll turn it red. So it's up to those majors to analyze that data that's in that grid, whether it be burglaries, robberies, rapes, homicides, and find out what's making that grid turn red. And then on that Monday and Thursday, they have to make a report as to why it turned red. If they don't have an answer, then that's a problem for me. So focusing on those red grids, those captains have two, ma uh, those majors have two captains. And each captain has a particular sector. This sector here is F. I know it's sector squads and all that kind of stuff you might not understand. But each district is divided into half, two portions. And each captain has one half of that. And each captain has people that work for him, and those people are responsible for the crime in that area. So when something happens or it turns red, it, everything kind of rolls downhill. And typically, be, you know, focusing on our offender-based profiles, we can find out what's happening in that grid and what's causing it to turn red, and then focus. 
So what we've, we've created was two groups, one that focuses on juveniles and the other that focuses on our adult offenders. So when a grid turns red, the information flows down, we provide it to our analysts and they create bulletins. And those bulletins typically have the, the vehicle information, the suspect information, any photos or videos attached, and it goes into this database. And we disseminate all our information to the police officers on the street, whether it be in this district or one of the other two districts. So just because um, a crime is happening here, that doesn't mean the bad guy lives here. He could live on the other side of town or he could live in the county. So with our offender-based profiling that we use and the Street Smart application, putting that information in there, an officer has the ability to go to a scene, investigate a crime, punch in the information, and once he punches in that information, he can push a button and send it to every single police officer in his department. So if you commit a crime in Ybor City and you're up on Bruce B. Downs, that officer gets that bulletin, he's able to read that bulletin, and if the car passes him or he knows that suspect by the picture, uh, then it's an easy arrest for us. You know, the, 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 the ultimate goal is to, when a crime is being committed, to solve that crime within 24 hours. Because the longer the bad guy is out on the street, the more crime they're gonna commit. So our education requirements to work in the crime lab at FDLE. A lot of people are really surprised at how much education it actually does take. A lot of our education is set forth by FBI and our accrediting bodies, so there is no way around it. You have to have a Bachelor of Science or some type of a Bachelor of Science related degree, whether it be biology, chemistry, forensic science. You have to have at least a four year degree to work in an accredited crime laboratory. In order to work in the biology section, you have to have nine credit hours of biochemistry, genetics, and molecular biology. That is absolutely required and set forth by the FBI. And it has to be the nine credit hours. A lot of universities do the combined like four and four. That doesn't count. You have to have nine credit hours of those three courses. And they would like you to have courses in statistics and microbiology as well. So it's not like you see on CSI and you're like, I got out of high school and I'm gonna go work in a crime lab. There's a lot of educational requirements that you have to have. To work in chemistry, you have to have a Bachelor of Science with 20 hours of chemistry courses. So that's about seven, seven chemistry courses. So short of being a chemistry major, you're probably not gonna get that. Even with my um, pre-med bachelors, I think I only had 18 hours of chemistry. So you really have to make sure if you know where you wanna work in the lab, find out what their educational requirements are so that you can meet those when you're going to school. If you wanna work in the other forensic disciplines, um, firearms, latent prints analysts, digital evidence, those only require just a general bachelor's degree with 20 credit hours of any type of science. So it could be oceanography, anatomy and physiology, just 20 hours of science so that they show that you're scientifically minded and basically you can think through a process and come to a conclusion. You also have to pass a background check. A lot of people are like, oh yeah, no problem. Well, a couple things FDLE has implemented in the past few years. So they do criminal and civil, everyone expects that. They also do a credit check. We have had a lot of amazing candidates fail background because they can't pass a credit check. So be prepared, anything in your background can come up when you come to work for a large law enforcement agency. You also have to have fingerprints taken, like any other law enforcement agency. Hopefully, if you're going to work for a law enforcement agency, regardless of TPD, HCSO, FDLE, you are upstanding, you don't do drugs, you haven't had a bad criminal past. But if you have, I'm just warning you, there are many things that do come up when you come to apply. So don't be shocked if something comes up and you don't get a job. Now, FDLE as a whole, most people think of just straight law enforcement. We're actually two sides of the house. We have our investigation side and we have our forensic side. Obviously, working in DNA, I work on the forensic side. On the investigation side, that's where we have all of our special agents. They investigate all types of cyber crime, um, child pornography. They also assist other agencies if they need investigations. FDLE also is involved with all the officer shootings. So if an officer is shot or sh shoots at someone, FDLE steps in as an unbiased party so that we can investigate anything that goes on in other law enforcement agencies. As far as the forensic side of the house, we have multiple different areas that you can work. 
biology, which is where I'm in, chemistry, computer evidence, or what we call digital evidence, firearms, impression evidence, or shoe tire, latent prints, trace evidence, and toxicology. And you'll see on some of those I've put where they're only at. So impression evidence is currently only in Tampa. They just condensed. So if that's something you're interested in, looking at shoe and tire impressions from crime scenes, you're in the right place. It's in Tampa. Trace evidence, we'll get into more about that, but that's only offered in Tampa and Orlando. And then toxicology is in Orlando and Tallahassee. So our salaries are not wonderful at all. Um, but if you love what you do, it's not about the money. The upper three, the crime lab analyst, supervisor, and chief, we may or may not be getting pay raises this year. If you've heard in the legislation, they're thinking about giving us a $10,000 base salary raise. Woohoo! Now I put little asterisks for the supervisory positions. Their positions are what is called at will. Meaning if you make one person mad and they don't like you, they can go, okay, you're gone. There's no write-up, there's no chain of command you have to answer to. You are at will so you can be fired at any point in time. So that's something you have to think of if you do want to move up the chain. Do I want to become a supervisor and become at will? Meaning I pretty much can get no warning and get fired. So I don't know if other agencies work that way. I personally am okay just staying an analyst because there are multiple steps in which they have to reach to fire me if something were to happen. So those are things you also have to take into account when you're moving up the chain. If you are looking to get into the crime lab um, on People First, which is the state government website, they have pools that refresh themselves every January and July. So if you do end up getting a four-year degree and want to apply to FDLE, make sure your name's in the pool because if a position comes open, they pull from those pools. They don't also necessarily put like a job announcement. They'll just go and pull from the pools and see who's applied and interested in the jobs. So why do I do what I do? I love my job as you saw with the pay. <laughs> I don't do it for the money. I absolutely love what I do. It's, it's different every day. You never know what you're gonna walk in and find. I love being able to feel like I make a difference. Now some people will be like, well, you know, are you working for the victim? Are you working for the prosecution? I'm not working for anyone. I'm working for the case. I'm a scientist. If you know anything about science, you propose your hypothesis, you run your test, and you write your results. So my hypothesis is, is there something here if so, does it match victim, suspect, and I either rule someone in or rule someone out? So I don't work necessarily for, you know, to put people in jail. If someone's being implicated of a crime and they didn't do it and their DNA is not there, they didn't do it. I say they don't do it. I have actually had a hand in um, one of our innocence projects around here probably, I want to say about five years ago. A gentleman was convicted of a sexual assault 31 years prior and they didn't have the advent of DNA that we have now. So they retested the sexual assault kit and it wasn't him. The DNA that was found in the sex assault was not him. So he got freed after serving 31 years in jail. He was 57 or 58 years old. So over his life, over half of his life he spent in prison because somebody implicated him of a crime. So that's kind of a good thing to be able to free people who didn't commit the crime. Also, we have great flexibility and benefits. We have what's called flex schedule. So we pretty much make our schedule as long as our 40 hours are between Monday through Friday, 8 to 8 p.m. So as long as you're there 40 hours during that time, you can pretty much come and go as you please, which is absolutely wonderful. Our benefits are amazing. If anyone has insurance or has to pay for insurance now, our family plan insurance is $180 a month. That's it. For me, my husband, and three kids. Our deductibles are like nothing. It's absolutely wonderful. Benefits, our pension is even better. If you retire from the state 25 or 30 years, depending on what you do, they take your highest five years and do an average of it, and that's what you get every month for the rest of your life, your standard pay. Yes, pension is amazing. Now, obviously you have to put your 3% in and you know, do all that type of stuff, and they can obviously nix your pension at any time because it depends on the legislator, but if it goes through, wonderful benefits. So, it is not like CSI. That's always the first question I always get. Not like CSI at all. Now, obviously CSI is for TV, it's for entertainment. You don't wanna sit here and watch an instrument run a DNA profile for six hours, <laughs> which is what happens. But it's wonderful because when that instrument's running for six hours, I can go start three more cases. So in order for there to be any type of forensic evidence, you have to have a crime scene 
Without a crime and a crime scene, you have no evidence. So a crime scene's a location where a crime has possibly occurred. There's a lot of caveat words that we use in the laboratory, such as possibly occurred, because you can't definitively say what happened. When you arrive there and you, know, you have two people that are stabbed and they're both bleeding, well, he stabbed me, he stabbed me, maybe. You don't know. So that's where I come in to help either corroborate or disprove different theories and stories that are propositioned from the law enforcement investigators. Crime scenes need to be secured immediately in order to preserve any possible evidence. As soon as a call comes in and you're dispatched, if you're a first responder, secure that crime scene. You need to make sure to secure the crime scene to protect the integrity of the evidence. Basically, since the O.J. Simpson trial, if any of you guys have been watching that show, for those of you that aren't old enough to remember it, basically since the mess ups that occurred during the O.J. Simpson trial, chain of custody and integrity of evidence has been of the utmost importance in criminal trials. Every time I testify, I am asked about my chain of custody, do I know what happened to it, do I know where it's going to go, all kinds of different things. So you have to make sure that you secure that crime scene to protect the integrity of what may or may not be there. You don't know at that point. Only the first investigator and crime scene technician should be allowed at the scene while evidence is being collected. So if you arrive as a first responder, you don't want to have 15 other deputies trompsing in and out and not figuring out who's going in and out of there. You can have contamination from other people or the personnel. You can have contamination from sample to sample. They can accidentally take evidence out on them. So you need to make sure that once your crime scene is secure, that the entry and exit is very, very contained to the minimum amount of personnel required. So how do you process or document a crime scene? Well, depending on what type of crime scene there is, there's usually five recommended types of search processes. You should make sure it's systematic. If it's systematic, that means that your entire crime scene area is going to get covered. You're not going to miss any small amounts of trace evidence, hair, fiber, blood, you know, a possible knife that's discarded somewhere. If it's systematic, you're going to be covering every square inch of the crime scene. Make sure to thoroughly document any and all items of possible evidence for collection, as this is the only time you have. Once the crime scene is released back to people, you cannot go back and collect more evidence because its integrity has been breached. So you need to make sure that you get everything while you're there. Collecting evidence. This is something, if you're even thinking about going into crime scene, that you need to pay attention to. Because it's up to you, not only as officers, deputies, detectives, crime scene personnel, how you collect and package your evidence depends on the quality of evidence that I get. And a lot of the times when we have major, major mess ups, it's not because of anything that we've done, it's because of the collection prior to being submitted to FDLE. Always make sure any and all evidence is documented prior to collecting. This is in case something happens in transit. Car accidents happen, things get dropped, things get broken, things get lost. Life happens. So prior to collecting and submitting anything to the agency, make sure you document where it was found. Take your pictures of it. Make sure to get thorough descriptions in case something happens to the physical piece of evidence. You have your written documentation. So life happens. Document everything because you never know what's going to happen. When you're collecting evidence, make sure you're wearing your protective equipment to make sure you're not contaminating the item as well as protecting yourself from any biological hazards. People are gross. People are just gross in general. They, I mean, fluids aerosolize and splash and get on you and they can have diseases. You don't know when you go to a crime scene what you're going to encounter. So not only are you trying to protect the integrity of the evidence, but you're protecting yourself as well. Even if you're in the field, if you're arresting someone or you have someone that's combative, always protect yourself first before anything else. Because if you can't protect yourself, the justice isn't going to be served. So make sure you're always covered. Make sure not only that, but you're not eating at the crime scene, chewing gum, talking, spitting, because DNA, for me to get a DNA profile, I only need 12 cells. So if you go like this and scratch your head, a few hundred cells will probably fall off that you don't even see. I need 12 to get an entire DNA profile. So you may not think you're putting your DNA anywhere, but you may be. So cover up real well when you're at a crime scene to make sure you're not contaminating anything. Ensure you're packaging items in the appropriate containers 
So when they're able to be analyzed when they get to the lab, very, very, very important. Anything that comes in for a biological analysis needs to be in a breathable container. Most bodily fluids are going to be wet at some point in time. So if you don't work in a facility that has a drying room, in essence, where you can put evidence out to dry, it needs to be in a paper bag, manila envelope, something that's going to let it breathe and dry. Chain of custody, also very important. From the moment an item is collected as a piece of evidence, it receives a chain of custody, which writes down every place that item has been. Depending on how your agency functions, it can be down to the second. At FDLE, we are electronic. I'm sure if everybody can see this. So this barcode, this is me in our laboratory information management system. So when I go to check out an item of evidence, every item of evidence has a unique barcode with a unique number. So they'll scan my badge, which indicates I'm taking it, scan the item of evidence, and then I put in my password. That way the chain of custody moves from wherever it's being stored into my possession down to the second in our laboratory information management system. So that's very important also for the integrity of the evidence. Sometimes you literally just get called to court to testify on chain of custody. And that's especially gonna be if you're a crime scene technician. A lot of times they will call you, what time did you respond? What time did you collect these swabs? What location did you collect these swabs or cartridge cases or knife? So you need to make sure that you're paying attention and documenting very well when you begin your chain of custody. Chain of custody allows for all people involved in the evidence collection for an item to be able, for an item to be able to be reached if there are any questions as to what happened. So basically, any person that's touched an item of evidence is able to be called to court. If nothing, then just to testify, did I have my hands on it? Did I do anything? If you're an evidence technician, you don't necessarily open the evidence at FDLE, you just hand it to someone. Occasionally you will get a deposition on that. So you didn't test it, were the seals intact? What information was noted on the outer container? So you have to make sure that you're documenting everything. We don't go to trial right away. I actually have a subpoena for a case this week from 2011. I average on, on par probably about 150 to 200 cases a year. So if you figure right now my numbers are probably up to 1,200 since I've been at FDLE. So in 1,200 cases, you will never remember every single thing you do. And if you're in the field, you'll be responding to way more than 200 cases a year. You'll be writing probably hundreds of reports a month. So you need to make sure that your notes are very explicit because you never know when you're gonna get called to court. So now we're gonna get into some of the fun stuff. So biology, we have what's considered two parts. We have serology and then the DNA analysis. So in the serology is where we're looking for the bodily fluids. At FDLE, we test for blood, semen, and or saliva, as well as collect swabs for what we call wearer or touch DNA. Wear DNA would be somebody left a hat or a t-shirt behind at the scene of a burglary or a robbery, so I'm going to attempt to swab those items to get a transfer of skin cells from the item that has been worn, so that hopefully we can figure out who the last person is to wear it. Handler DNA would be if somebody attempted to burglarize a home and they know they went in through one point of entry and the point of exit was the same, they would possibly take swabs from the door. Um, if there was a sexual assault and the um, victim showed signs of strangulation, they would take basically touch swabs of her neck to see if there was any transfer of DNA at that point in time. All we do with serology is we collect items of evidence. There's no identification of DNA that comes forth at that point. Just do we have any type of fluid? If not, we're gonna collect skin cells. DNA. I'm sure if you guys watch the news at all, you're seeing sexual assault kits being raked across the media day in and day out. There is a big initiative that's going through the House right now that's basically forcing agencies to submit sexual assault kits within 30 days of collection, and they're attempting to propose us to require analysis completion within 120 days of submission. Prior to all of these old cases being submitted, 120 days is not a problem. Our turnaround time was an average about 45 to 60 days. We currently have kits that are going back to the early 1990s that haven't been submitted. Oh yeah. To tell you guys just how many areas we work, in FDLE Tampa, 
our region of working goes all the way down from Sarasota County up to Citrus County and out to Polk County. So we work evidence from every sheriff's office, police department, small police department, I mean like, you know, Wachula, like we're talking like small police departments. Every agency from Sarasota up to Citrus and out to Polk has submitted to us probably at FDLE alone over 2,500 sexual assault kits that have not gone tested over however many years. Um, I have already actually gone to court on one of them. It was a 1997 sexual assault case where the girl was waiting for a ride after Gasparilla and got hit in the head and pulled behind bushes and sexually assaulted. Why it wasn't submitted, I don't know. There's a myriad of reasons, I don't even ask. Um, I was able to actually get an entire DNA profile of a male, foreign to the female victim, and it hid in our database. The guy's defense was not that he wasn't there, it wasn't that he didn't do it, it was why was it submitted 18 years later? I don't know, but it was, and he hit in CODIS and it was confirmed, so he ended up taking a plea deal. So a lot of these cases, we are getting very good CODIS hits on them, we are getting results. But because we have been so inundated numerically with these amount of cases, our backlog right now, our turnaround time is about six to eight months. And we are very fast in Tampa. Like our speed as far as processing and completion, we're amazing compared to some of the other regions. So right now we're looking at probably clearing our backlog in about two to three years on top of working our regular cases. So that's just something, if you guys see it in the media, you now have some personal background knowledge as to what's really going on. Like I said, I don't know why they weren't submitted. We don't deal with the agencies on that. But as FDLE comes forth, we are trying our darndest to get these cases processed, submitted into our database if applicable, and get these people put behind bars for things that they have done over the last few decades. So what is your DNA? It makes you function who you are day to day. It makes you a human. It gives you a head, two arms, two legs. Over 99% of your DNA is common from person to person. It's that 1% of DNA that varies that gives us our different skin color, hair color, our different builds, our sizes, the way our body metabolizes foods differently, allergies, things like that. So it's that very small variation in the DNA in which we look at to identify one person from the next. Every cell in your body has DNA except for red blood cells. Red blood cells only function is to transport oxygen. That's all it does. But every other cell in your body has DNA in it. Some things that can have DNA, blood, saliva, urine, hair, teeth, bone, tissue, skin cells, literally everything in your body except for blood, except for your red blood cells. Where do you get your DNA? I'm sure you guys probably know this, sperm meets egg, half DNA from mom, half DNA from dad, okay? If you don't know this by now, I'm sorry, I can't teach you that. <laughs> so here's a nice little color diagram. Got mo Mom's got two different colored chromosomes, dad's got two different colored chromosomes. What happens is within mom's eggs and dad's sperm, when they begin to split, they can have what we call crossing over events. So that's why you never 100% look like either parent. You'll have like a little bit of mix of the grandparents from both sides. That's because as you see the colors mixing up, you get crossing over from both of your parents and both of their parents. So it's never like you get one chromosome from grandpa on mom's side and one chromosome from grandpa on dad's side. It never works like that. There's always gonna be some type of what we call crossing over. Now no two people have the same DNA except identical twins. What type? Identical, right? Not fraternal. Why identical? One cell. Uh, one egg. Yeah, it, it's basically one cell. So it's one sperm, one egg that meet, and then split. You can have identical triplets. It is possible to have one cell that splits three ways. That would be my worst nightmare. <laughs> but fraternal would be two eggs and two sperm. So they will have similar DNA, but it will not be identical. The only people with identical DNA are identical twins. Occasionally, we will get crimes that are committed by what we get hits as identical twins. It's happened probably five times in the almost seven years I've been at FDLE. So we put a DNA profile into our database and it hits on a convicted offender under two different names. 
Hmm, okay, so then we call the detective. Oh yeah, they're twins. Okay, well they're identical. So here's both names, and now it's up to you guys to figure out who was where. <laughs> because DNA can't do it for you at that point because they're identical twins. So here you go. <laughs> that, it's up to them to do footwork at that point. So what do I look for in a DNA profile? So basically we do a whole lot of chemical additions and all these fancy scientific processes to give us colored peaks on a graph. <laughs> Right, real hard. So what we actually physically do isn't real hard, but we have to know the academic and educational background to why we do what we do. All of the genetics, all of the chemistries behind it, the biochemistries of how your body works, cellular chemistries, all of that stuff we have to know. So that's why it's like, oh, well all you're doing is reading peaks on a graph. Yes, in the end, but for what we have to know as to how we get these peaks on the graph, it's a lot more in depth than that. So, when I get samples, I'm gonna look at initially the green. So do I get all green? That's wonderful. That's showing me, basically it's a single source profile. This is actually our positive control. So every time we run DNA samples, we run a positive control and a negative control. The positive control is a known single source profile that basically shows us our tests work. Our negative control will be nothing. It's literally just nothing but just little squiggly lines across the board that should not have DNA in it. The negative control shows that our processes are clean and that there's no contamination. So it's very important because defense attorneys just love to harp on contamination. So if you can have make sure everything's clean, you're good to go. So looking at this beautiful profile, you see some areas have one peak, some areas have two peaks. What we look at within the DNA profile is, like I said, you get one from mom and one from dad. So we look at, in the DNA profile, what we call short tandem repeats, which are actually repetitive DNA in certain areas on your chromosomes. So what we do is we count these numbers of repeats, and that's what our peaks on the graph are. So if you could actually read this, the peak on the graph, and then there will be a little number below it, that's how many repeats we're looking at at that specific area in the DNA profile. Now occasionally, you'll get this lovely jumble of bunches of peaks over here. I shouldn't say occasionally, I would say more often than not, this is the real data that we see. We don't usually get these nice pretty single source samples. This is actually from a case that I'm currently working. I think, I can't remember if this was a cutting or a swab, um, but it was from a piece of clothing and it was known to be from a victim, it was from an attempted sexual assault. So the peaks that are very high, those are the ones that came from the victim. But then as you look here, one, two, three, so there's at least three extra peaks. If you look in the top right over here, in the second row down, there's actually four extra peaks. So we can guesstimate the number of contributors based on the area that has the highest number of peaks on the graph. So based on the area that has six peaks, I'm able to say that's a mixture of at least two people on top of the victim. So it's not always nice and pretty and easy. At that point, I have to sit down and I literally have to hand write math and we have to calculate ratios between the victim and the second person and the second person and the third person and so on. So there's a lot of hand math and ratio calculations that you have to be able to do to sometimes get a DNA profile. So we also offer chemistry. What does chemistry do? They examine unknown powders and pills to detect a variety of different drugs. Can be cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine, MDMA or ecstasy, heroin. They also test for um, paraphernalia. So you can submit swabs from you know, a suspected crack pipe or a bong or things like that. They will test and see if they can find trace residues of those drugs in the paraphernalia as well. Currently at FDLE, we are only actually running drug tests for cases that are going to court. Chemistry has an absolutely crazy backlog, well worse than biology will ever be, and they only have seven analysts in the chemistry section. We have 26 in biology. So, chemistry only tests cases that they know are going to court. So once a court date's set, they'll let them know, hey, you have two or three months to get your analyses and get out the door. 
With that being said, they testify a lot more than we do since all of their cases they know are going to court unless they take a plea. So they testify on average, probably I'd venture at least to say two times a week. So if chemistry is your thing and you like talking to people, drug chemistry in the lab is the way to go. Computer evidence recovery, digital evidence. This is not a job I think I would personally like to have. They're locked in a room by themselves for the nature of what they do, the nature of the beast. A lot of their stuff is gonna be child pornography. So unless you wanna be looking for child porn all day, digital evidence is probably not your thing because that's a majority of what they do. They're also very, very tech savvy. This is probably the only field of FDLE where you can pretty much get in without having a Bachelor of Science. In fact, you would probably have a Bachelor of Arts if you're working in some type of computer engineering degree. They're usually not BS degrees. So if you're super techie and you're okay with looking at child porn all day, get a four-year degree and go work in computer evidence recovery. If not at FDLE, there's a ton of private areas for computer evidence and digital recovery. Huge market for it. They can pretty much examine anything that's digital. Hard drives, laptops, cell phones. I love lecturing like the younger kids and I like to tell them that nothing's ever deleted. And then they give me this look. What do you mean? So what's that, Snapchat? Is that the one that deletes quickly? I'm old, I'm showing my age. So when you're like, oh, your Snapchat deletes within 24 hours, it doesn't. See, this Snapchat company has this nice little cloud where they like to store everything for however long they save it for, just in case a criminal investigation comes up. Same thing with Facebook and Twitter and all those, oh, well, we, you're protected, no, you're not. All they have to do is give you a warrant and then they'll give you anything that you put into your digital or social media. Something I forgot to mention with educational and job requirements, at FDLE now, you have to give them access to your social media. Ooh. Within the last year, it has actually become part of our policy where when you apply, you basically tell them or give them access to search your social media. So don't put anything into print that you don't want to come back and bite you later. Because a lot of agencies now are going, because you're like, oh, I'm perfect, I work great, and then you're you know, getting drunk on weekends and doing stupid stuff. That's not what they want you to do. When you are working for an agency, you are always representing that agency, both when you're at work and when you're off the clock. So that's something you always have to remember. So don't put anything on your social media that you don't want our guys to find. They assist with all types of investigations, fraud, drug, identity theft, computer hacking. If it has any type of a digital media outlet, that's what they deal with. Firearms, shoot guns all day, be lots of fun. So what does firearms do? They analyze bullets and cartridge cases, basically trying to figure out were these related to a crime scene or can they be related to a gun? Sometimes they'll only have bullets or cartridge cases left behind at the scene. They can actually do their comparison and upload them into their database, which will either hit on similar ammunition and or guns that have been previously test fired. They also do distance determination. How far away was the subject from the victim when the victim was shot? So with their distance determination, they use a series of different chemicals to actually apply to the clothing of a victim that was shot and figure out based on the spread of the gunshot residue, how far was a person when they were shot? I like to tell my students it's kind of like a flashlight. When you walk real close with something, it gets real narrow. Gunshot residue is gonna do the exact same thing. So if I'm standing back and shooting him from back here, he's probably not gonna get any gunshot residue on him. But if I shoot him point blank, there's gonna be a nice tight concentration of gunshot residue that's gonna be deposited on the wound. Serial number restoration. Used to help track guns within multiple scenes, gangs, or locate stolen property. Every gun that is legally purchased, legally should be registered, into a database saying, this is my gun, I illegally own it. Obviously, as we all know, criminals aren't the most upstanding of people, which is why we have jobs. So what they try to do is they take the guns and they attempt to obliterate the serial numbers that are on the guns. Well, joke's on them, because the way they actually impart these serial numbers onto the guns is they take the barrel and they stamp it into the metal. So they actually compress the metal fragments on the barrel of the gun. So short of literally grinding down into the center of the barrel, which would then render the gun unusable because the barrel is going to be cracked, you cannot remove the serial number. 
So what our people do, if they see it slightly obliterated, they'll put some acid on it, which actually eats away at the metal, and then it pops up that serial number all nice and pretty. And then they can put it in their database and see, was it stolen from someone? Did someone re report their gun stolen? Is this gun, has it been taken in possession multiple times from different gang members? Things like that. So that's another thing they can aid in. And then gunshot residue analysis, very similar to distance determination and the fact that they use a series of different chemicals, but gunshot residue is normally going to be, is it on someone's hands? And if it is on someone's hands, is it in a high enough concentration to say that they shot a gun versus handling a gun? Because obviously if I just go and pick up a gun that somebody doesn't clean, there's a chance I could get gunshot residue on my hands. But if I go and pop off a magazine of nine rounds, I'm probably gonna have a lot more gunshot residue on my hands from shooting the gun nine or 10 times than I would for just picking it up. So that's something too that you have to be able to, I guess, apply with conviction when you're testifying is based on how much gunshot residue would I as an expert expect someone to be holding a gun or shooting a gun. Impression evidence. This is pretty fun. It's, it's very interesting what they do with impression evidence. At FDLE we call it shoe tire because that's all they look at, shoes and tires. So initially they're gonna analyze class characteristics very general basic characteristics from a known versus an unknown. In case you haven't ever looked at your shoes or even looked at your tires, the way you walk, the way you drive, the way you take corners, if you don't rotate your tires, all of those impart unique characteristics on your tires and shoes. If you walk more on your right leg, you're gonna wear more on the bottom of your right sole than you would your left. This is all the things they look at. So initially they're gonna say, well, is this shoe consistent in size or is this tire consistent in size with the known versus the unknown? If it's very generally consistent, then they'll move on looking at the individual characteristics, the different wear areas, are you missing pieces of tread, the overall pattern, things like that. A lot of times they're gonna use casting. Most of the time they're going to actually be getting the casts in. Obviously, if you're following tire tracks in the swamp where a body has been dumped, you can't pick up chunks of the swamp and submit it to the laboratory. Common sense, right? So you're gonna be using basically a dental cast to pour into whatever tire tracks or shoe prints you see to attempt it to aid in lifting those casts, as you see there, for analysis once they get back to the lab. Now, a lot of times they're not gonna have necessarily a suspect tire or shoe to compare to right away. So what they'll do, their database works a little differently. It doesn't tell you this shoe belongs to John Doe or this tire belongs to the Ford Explorer from John Doe. What they'll do is they'll give a general characteristic of the shoe. So what they'll do is they'll get a range of either tire size or shoe, which will then aid as a tool in the investigation for the detective to either get a warrant, search the car to see if the tire sizes match what the database pulled up, or to see if they find the shoes at the suspect's home. So our databases don't solve the crimes, they're just a tool to help the detectives basically nail the guy to the wall if they can. Electrostatic lifting, if you guys have taken the fingerprint class at all, it's very similar, except instead of lifting fingerprints, you're just gonna be lifting shoe and tire impressions. Works in the same manner, same with dusting, with the lifting, contrasting background and tape, except you're just gonna be working in a larger atmosphere with a tire or a shoe versus fingerprints. Speaking of fingerprints, what we call our fingerprint department at FDLE is the latent print section. The term latent means invisible. Generally speaking, a majority of the fingerprints left at crime scenes are invisible. Hence the name, latent fingerprint. If it's invisible, you have to be able to lift it and bring it up so you can analyze it. So a latent fingerprint is a fingerprint that's left at the scene but cannot be seen by the naked eye. Every person has different fingerprints, even identical twins. The reason this is, is because your fingerprints are formed when you're about 10 to 14 weeks gestation in your mama's belly. So you're about the size of a jelly bean and you already have fingerprints. It's the way in which you're positioned in utero at that point and the way that the amniotic fluid is flowing around your developing skin that causes your fingerprint development. So even identical twins that are in the same amniotic sac with the same fluid are not gonna be touching one another to develop identical fingerprints. 
So in cases where you have identical twins with identical DNA, but then you have fingerprints too, fingerprints are going to be your golden standard at that point because they're not going to be the same for both of those identical twins. So you need to make sure when you're working your case that you're trying to get all of the pieces together. As scientists, you never hear one of us go, DNA's better, chemistry's better. We all work together to create a linking puzzle to figure out what happened at a crime scene. Different types of latent print processing. So Amido Black is something that's a chemical that they put on that are able to enhance different types of blood prints. It's a very specific chemical that they use if you have like a footprint um, or a handprint in physical blood, Amido Black would be the chemical you want to use to bring it up. Super glue fuming, cyanoacrylate. Super glue is a lot of fun. I don't know if you guys do it in the fingerprint class or not, but they have like super glue guns where you just put the little cartridge in and you actually can like fume large items. Um, we have giant tanks where we put our items of evidence in. And literally all it is is you just heat regular super glue up to a high temperature to where it starts to vaporize. And it actually binds to the sweat that's left from your fingerprints. And it leaves a nice permanent little print on whatever you're developing from. Literally locks it in place. So at that point in time, you can determine what type of chemical processing you want to do to enhance the print. Super glue is awesome. So much fun. Ninhydrin, this is something we typically use on paper or porous items. It's actually up there in the right hand corner. So ninhydrin is a chemical that you spray on porous items and it chemically reacts with the amino acids in your sweat and it gives this nice bright purple blue color. Ninhydrin will stay if preserved properly. Since it's something that's going to be wet at some point, you want to make sure you let it dry before you do any type of storage so that it doesn't mold or crack. And then obviously the old school fail proof powders. There are tons of different types of powders. You can have fluorescent powders, black powders, white powders. The important thing to know about your powder is you should always use a contrasting powder from what you're dusting and then place it onto a contrasting card. So if I'm gonna be dusting this table here, it's grayish. I would probably use a black powder because gray you might not see. I would use a black powder. I would use a clear tape and then put that on a white card. You want to make sure that you can see the fingerprint to analyze it. Now, if you can physically see the fingerprint without having to lift it, photograph it before you lift it in case something happens when you're trying to lift it. Bloody fingerprints don't always work as well as you would expect, but if you're able to get a nice photograph of it before you lift it, a lot of times if something happens when you're lifting it, they can still process off of the photograph you take at the scene. So make sure document, document in case something were to happen. Trace evidence is basically what the name says. It's trace, it's microscopic. It's things you can't see with the naked eye. Examples include fiber, hair, glass, paint, plastic, soil, feathers, and pollen. They are also able to identi identify a fiber type. So if you don't like microscopes, trace is probably not your thing because your face is completely buried in a microscope 24 seven because you cannot see the stuff otherwise. Now the picture down here, the picture up top is showing a fracture match. So basically what happened is, is they found a piece of a fingernail at a scene and they took a casting of the victim's finger, which was deceased. And they're trying to match up the fracture match from the nail on the victim to the piece of nail they found at the crime scene. You can see the match is almost perfect. So, down on the bottom, they have a comparison scope. On the comparison scope, you have your known on one side and your unknown on the other. And what you do, whether it is for trace evidence or firearms analysis, you're going to try to line up your known versus your unknown and see if they could be coming from the consistent source, coming from the same cartridge case, bullet, fiber, hair, whatever type of comparison you're doing. Toxicology, this is my second baby, tox is fun. Um, toxicology works very similarly to drug chemistry. The only difference is instead of actually having the paraphernalia and the drugs and things like that, what you actually have to examine are bodily fluids, blood, urine, um, pieces of organ if the person is deceased and they don't have any other bodily fluids. And a lot of times you'll get multiple different pieces of organ because drugs metabolize through different areas of your body. 
So depending on what type of, type of drug it is, it could metabolize through your kidneys or through your liver or be primarily excreted through your lungs. It depends on what type of drug it is. So a lot of times they'll submit different samples of tissues to figure out the different concentrations to see what drug is present and in what manner. Toxicology is not always also just illegal drugs. The case that I think of is Anna Nicole Smith's death. If you guys ever want to see something interesting, Google her toxicology report. She had like 20 different legal drugs, legally prescribed, in the legal amounts that they should be prescribed. But because she had so many different doctors prescribing, they prescribed a lot of the same different types of drugs that basically just overwhelmed her body and the toxic metabolites couldn't exit. So she basically legally overdosed herself just based on the cocktail that she took on a daily basis. So a lot of toxicology is that too. And then they can look back on the doctors and say, well, did you know she was prescribed this? If so, why did you give her this other drug that cross reacts the exact same way that you know is toxic? Same thing with a pharmacist. That's why every time you go to the pharmacy, are these your drugs? Do they keep them up to date? Very important to let them know that because that's something that they look at prior to dispensing you a drug is will this drug cross react with other things that you're legally already on? So it's very important to look at those things. Toxicology can also include using a breathalyzer at the scene of a crime or sending off samples to a laboratory for analysis. Obviously in the state of Florida, you should know if you have a Florida license, you, when you sign on that dotted line to get your license, that is giving the consent of you if you get pulled over for suspicion of drunken or intoxicated driving to provide a sample. Whether it be a urine or a blood sample, you are required to keep your license to submit a sample. If you do not, you lose your license for a year. Now additionally, if you get into a car accident and you are unable to give consent and you get whisked away to the hospital, they're always going to draw blood on you. That blood will be sent in for toxicology analysis. So toxicology isn't just necessarily illegal drugs, but it's also dealing with DUIs and DWIs and things like that. So that is pretty much what we do at FDLE. We have a myriad of any science you could imagine, and it's tons of fun.